7 o'clock. Uh, we do uh, have a long list of people to speak tonight, so I want to get this started on time. I do realize that people are trickling in, and that's fine. Um, if they can sign in in the next few minutes, uh, that's great. If they don't have an opportunity to sign in, uh, we will have uh, an opportunity at the end of these speakers to invite other people to speak at the podium. Uh, my name is Jason Coit. I'm a compliance analyst with the University of Connecticut. Uh, we are here tonight for a public hearing on our environmental impact evaluation for potential sources of water supply. With me is David Murphy from My Lonely Broom. He's the lead preparer of the EIE document. He will be giving a 10 to 15 minute presentation overview of the EIE and the EIE process. Uh, before then, just a few words. Uh, we obviously do have a lot of people to speak tonight. Um, so we will be using a, a three minute limit on the time to speak. Uh, I'll be sitting at the moderator desk as well. I will be notifying you with a piece of paper uh, when one minute is left and when 30 seconds is left. Uh, we have comment forms at the head table as well. If you wish to send, you know, write a note as a written comment, we will accept that officially. Um, we are, of course, accepting written comments uh, during this comment period, which will close on the 31st. <clears throat> Tonight, we will be receiving uh, verbal comments as part of the hearing process. Uh, just a few other notes. Um, we've gotten several requests uh, that the comments we've received to date be posted publicly. Uh, we will be posting those on our website, the Office of, Yukon Office of Environmental Policy website. Uh, you'll see the link to that, I believe, at the end of the presentation. So those comments will be publicly available shortly. Um, as I said, feel free to sign in. We will be, um, I understand that there are several municipal officials here in the audience tonight. Uh, if they wish to speak first, we will give them the opportunity to speak first. Uh, if not, uh, if they've signed in, we will just read their name in accordance in, in the order in which they've signed in. Uh, following any municipal officials who have signed in, uh, we will simply read through the list of names that have signed in thus far. Uh, once everyone has had a chance to speak their comments, um, we will then, like I said, open the floor to other comments. If you had not had a chance to finish your comments within the three minute period, uh, we welcome you to come back after everyone has uh, had at least one chance to speak uh, in order for you to finish your comment. Uh, with that, I will hand the mic over to David Murphy and he will give his presentation on the EIU. Thank you. Hi everybody. Please come on in if you're in the waiting room. You won't get to see the presentation unless you can try to come on in. Don't feel shy about um, finding a place to stand in the back or whatnot. Okay, I'm David Murphy from my Lone McBroom, um, senior associate at the firm, and I was responsible for a large part of the drafting of the EIE. Um, I'm happy to tell you that I'm not going to read the thousand page document tonight, uh, but what I, what I do want to do, this is an important presentation that maybe um, we haven't really spent time on before. This is a presentation of how we got to this point. I think there's some important background information here, and so I'm happy to, to go into some of that with you guys tonight. Okay. So the university completed a water supply plan um, like they did in the 90s, and then about 2004, there was an update prepared in, in 2011, so a couple years ago. The water supply plan is filed with DPH, DEP, and other state agencies. Now the water supply plan identified the need for additional water supplies to improve margins of safety. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute. Um, in addition to needing to improve margin of safety, UConn needs some additional supplies for continued growth on campus. It's important to note that there is there are plans to reuse and to differently use land that's on campus already, and so that is land that needs to be served with water if it is to be developed into additional um, educational facilities. Now, the town of Mansfield also requires water um, for some of its uh, areas of town. Important point here, the town of Mansfield prepared a water supply plan, I think it's been more than 10 years now, I think it was 2001-2002 plan, that really well documented where water might be needed in town to address areas of contamination and growth, and so those numbers have been carried forward in plans over the years, and so there's a long history of the town of Mansfield expressing a need for water. That was taken into account in this environmental impact evaluation. So as a joint effort, UConn and the town together identified the simple <coughs> process, Connecticut Environmental Policy Act, um, as a means to evaluate alternatives for future water supplies. Now, the Connecticut Environmental Policy Act, SEPA, is like the state equivalent of NEPA. You've heard of NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. 
The outcome of CFUT is an environmental impact evaluation, which is a document we call an EIE, which is a document that many of you have read. It's on the UConn's website. There's a copy over there across the room. So who relies on the UConn water system? Uh, the university and its facilities are the primary uh, user of water uh, from the water system. About 85% of consumption is um, campus facilities. But the town, so schools, town hall, community center in the town of Mansfield, and then also private off-campus residential commercial customers consume a good 15% of the water in the water system. So when we say it's a joint effort, we really do mean it's a joint effort because if more water is brought to Mansfield, to the stores area, it will be used by UConn and by the town and by people who live in the town. So why doesn't UConn have sufficient water? Well, um, on paper, legally, you might think that they do. Uh, you've heard of diversion permits and diversion registrations. This is a policy that was implemented in the 80s um, by the legislature to try to allocate and regulate water use in the state. It's sort of like water laws, but here in Connecticut we don't have adjudicated water rights, we have um, riparian water rights. So on paper, UConn has about 0.8 million gallons per day from the Fenton River well field, and about 2.3 million gallons per day from the Willimantic River well field. So together, if you add those up, UConn has an abundant supply of water, again, on paper legally. This is 3.1 million gallons per day. Now, safe yield is a different number. Safe yield is what you can draw out of the ground, um, what the wells can really pull. Those numbers are a little bit lower. For the Fenton River well field, it's about the same, about 0.8 million gallons per day. For the Willimantic River well field, it's just under 2, 2 million gallons per day. So down from the 2.3 to about 2 million gallons per day for a peak day, for meeting an average day, the number is a little bit lower. It's about 1.5 million gallons per day. So here's where the, the crux of the, the situation comes into play here. So the available supply is further restricted because UConn has been... Um, throttling down their production when stream flows get low in the Fenton River and the Willimantic River. So what, what does that mean? Well, the Fenton River well field has sort of a hard and fast throttling down. When the flows get low in the Fenton River, available supply essentially goes to zero. There's a period of time, really almost every summer, not just dry summers, where water is not pumped from that well field. And that's been a cooperative arrangement with DEP and other stakeholders to try to keep flows uh, as robust as possible in the Fenton River. The Willimantic River has flow cutoffs too, but they're not hard and fast like the Fenton River well field. So if, if flows get low in the Willimantic River, what happens is conservation is implemented, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But what this means is that for a period of time, every spring, summer, and fall, you know, longer during dry years, all that's available to Yukon, down from there 3.1 million gallons per day, is under 2 million gallons per day. So how does that affect margins of safety? Well, margin of safety is supply divided by what the, the need is. So it's a unitless number, and what DPH, Connecticut DPH, wants to see as Department of Public Health are margins of safety above 1.15. You have to be above 1, but they like to see it above 1.15. That's the 15% margin of safety that we talk about. So this is a table just showing um, all the months of the year. The first column is available water from the Willimantic River Wells. The second column is what's available from the Fent River Wells. You'll see we carry zeros for June, July, August, September, and October. That's the low flow time of the year. There's a column that shows the total available supply. And then what we have is a column towards the end, what the system needed, uh, average 2009 through 2010. These numbers are taken from the water supply plan, which is why we're using data that's a couple years old. But it's, it's essentially the same as it is today. Demands have been relatively flat the past couple years. And you can see in the final column the margin of safety, which is, again, the supply divided by what's needed in the water system. So January, you know what? UConn's sitting pretty. They have 2.32 million gallons per day available. Demand is, is you know, only half that. So margin of safety is really almost two. But if you look down, further down the table, September, October, when the Fenton River wells are off, there's periods of time where margin of safety is below one. That is not acceptable. DPH does not accept that situation. How does UConn get through it? Well, they have a substantial amount of storage. They also can pump their wells for longer periods of time on certain days. So, so they can meet the demand but it's not a desirable place to be. So what has UConn done to conserve? Frankly, um, more than I've seen any other water system, and I've written probably 15 water supply plans, I've never seen conservation like I've seen at UConn. There are two types of conservation that are going on at UConn. Uh, there's, there are everyday uh, types of conservation that are implemented when stream flows get low in the Fenton, and River, Fenton River and Willimantic River. Those are what we call the tactical methods that are used each year to guide the U to guide UConn through the various protocols of their 
uh, management plans that are in place for the two well fields. And then number two, which is very important as well, are the sort of long-term strategic methods of reducing water usage that have been going on for a good 10 years now, such as replacing fixtures and then also building the new reclaimed water facility, which we'll talk about in a moment. So that's what UConn has done, but are they effective? Well, they are indeed uh, very effective. If you look at the um, what we call the tactical conservation, so this is what you can do um, one day to the next just to get through periods of low flow in the Fenton and Willamette Rivers, we're comparing one year, 2007, which is a dry year, to 2006, which was less dry. So total water production in 2007 was 5% lower than it was in 2006, 14% lower than it was in 2005, just by implementing these day-to-day -day conservation methods. No washing of the fleet, Yukon's vehicle fleet, uh, shorter showers, that sort of thing, using paper plates instead of washing dishes. Um, looking at, so that's the whole year, 2007, 6, and 5, but if you look at August and September, which is that time when students come back to campus and population really explodes, but also when stream flows are very low, if you look at 2007, August, and September, uh, water usage was down about 11% and 7% compared to the previous year. So UConn really can uh, cause a savings of water when they implement these day-to-day -day conservation methods. So what about the long term? Is there conservation that's working? Is it effective? The answer again is yes. If you look at average daily production over the last past 10, 15 years, it has declined. Um, it was about 1.49 million gallons per day. So this is average for the whole year. Um, in 2005, it's only 1.26 in this past calendar year, 2012. So average daily water usage has declined. Um, Another measure that's important to look at is the max month average day. So this is the month where the most water is pumped, which is typically September when students come back. What's the average for September? Well, that's decreased over the years as well. It's been relatively flat the past couple of years at 1.6 million gallons per day, but last year it was 1.5 million gallons per day. So again, when UConn needs to conserve water, it can. And that's how it's getting by with these low margins of safety. So long-term conservation measures as a whole have decreased average demands. Um, and what's important and interesting, really, is this has happened even as population has increased. So average town in Connecticut um, can't say the same thing. If they have population increasing, they don't always see overall demand uh, decreasing. Or they have flat population and they see demand decreasing. But UConn has population increase and demand um, is decreasing as well. But is this enough to restore margins of safety? Because really that's the key question and that's how we, we sort of got to this place where we are. So although water conservation has helped UConn meet its demands when the Fent River well field is shut down, um, unfortunately margins of safety remain below one sometimes in, during dry years. And they, they don't need to be above one, they need to be above 1.15. So there's an important gap there. And not only that, but UConn as a water utility it must meet water supply commitments on sites within its campus. And properties that are within the confines of campus or adjacent to it, if they need to hook up to a water supply, that's the only water supply that there is. So there's an obligation to really serve what's adjacent to them and what's within their campus. So there are a couple of key actions that have been implemented to restore margins of safety. Well, continued conservation. Conservation's here, it's not going away, it's going to continue. But using the new reclaimed water facility is one way uh, to help cut down water demands. Now the reclaimed water facility construction has been completed this, this past year, I believe, and it will be operational here um, sometime in 2013. What UConn will be doing, which is the first of its kind in the state, is um, treating wastewater, sanitary wastewater, when you flush your toilet, where does it go, the treatment plant, um, <coughs> taking that excuse me, beyond tertiary treatment using microfiltration, to produce a very high quality reclaimed water. So this is water that can be used not for drinking, but for non-potable uses such as heating and cooling at the central utility plant. And while that will help immensely some of these um, future water demands, help get closer to the margin of safety, additional water supplies are still needed. Here's a graph. So this graph doesn't have a timeline. You'll see the x-axis is just blank, and that's okay because we're just talking about the period of time from this point forward. Now the heavy black line shows how water supply really has, sharp, drop, has dropped sharply when withdrawals decrease from the Fent River well field. So that's the top black line, and you see the big drop, and there's an arrow pointing to that inflection point. Now the blue line shows current peak month water demands, which are about 1.5, 1.6 million gallons per day. 
And then there's a little U-shaped drop there which shows what's going to happen when reclaimed water comes online. So there'll be a period of time where uh, uh, demands on the water system decrease because central utility plant will be using treated wastewater. But then when additional committed demands, these are demands that are already in the Yukon campus, such as redevelopment of the depot campus, when those come online, that blue line is going to come back up. And then in the future, it'll be coming up again and crossing it back over that black line. So that shows how there will be a deficit moving forward. So what are the proposed actions to address this deficit, to restore these margins of safety, and have them be intact 60 years out? So what you could have wanted to do is devise a solution for the 50-year planning horizon that includes the town's needs. Remember I told you at the beginning of the talk, Mansfield produced a water supply plan more than 10 years ago. That water supply plan isn't going anywhere. It's talked about what the water demands are for the town and in the town outside campus. And it's time for, for everyone to come together to address those water needs. But there's a desire to do this once, not come back every five years, come back every 10 years, and ask for more water. That's not going to work. It's going to frustrate everybody. Everybody's going to be not happy with that solution. So the best solution is to develop a new source of supply, what the number is right now, up to 1.9 million gallons per day. That's for a peak day. It's a little bit lower for an average day talked about what peak day and average day were a few minutes ago. So 1.9 million gallons per day would be available to the Yukon water system for Yukon and for the town. So that would restore margins of safety, make sure that they stay above 1.15. Not above 1, but above 1.15, which is what's required by Connecticut DPH. They could still, Yukon could still protect aquatic habitat in the Fent River and Willimantic River. Um, flows in the Fent River would still, if they got below a certain threshold, that well field would be throttled down. Um, and then if flows in the Willimantic River got below a certain threshold, then conservation would be, would be kicked up. So those types of conservation methods will continue, probably forever. This additional supply will also enable growth, education, research, economic development on campus and adjacent to campus. UConn has prepared various plans, an academic plan, there's a North Campus Master Plan for the proposed tech park. The Mansfield Plan of Conservation and Development was prepared most recently in 2006, I believe. Perhaps you're somewhere or not if I'm wrong, or shake your head if I'm wrong. And then the update to the Plan of Conservation and Development is actually underway, starting, I think, about now. So there was a desire to bring water into certain parts of town. Again, I mentioned water supply plan in Mansfield developed more than 10 years ago, stating that much. So the reclaimed water facility will help bridge that gap. I showed you the graph a couple of minutes ago with a U shape but it doesn't resolve the need for additional water supply. So what the environmental impact evaluation did was it looked at a series of alternatives. We looked at the no action, you know, what could be done on campus if there was no future water supply. We looked at interconnections with existing water utilities, reservoir base, so the Connecticut Water Company, which has a system as close as Tolland, Wind and Water Works, which is active in Willimantic and Southern Mansfield, and then the MDC system, which is in the Hartford area. We also looked at new groundwater supplies, along the Willimantic River and down near Mansfield Hollow Lake. And we looked at the relocation or replacement of Fenton Well A. The, the impetus for this last one is there was thinking that if we moved Fenton Well A uh, somewhere further away from the Fenton River, it might be able to be used for a longer period of time with less impact to the river. There were criteria for these alternatives. We needed to weigh them against. The combination of sources or the new source must yield up to 1.9 million gallons per day. The new groundwater supply is not only will they have to yield that much water, but they must meet a sanitary code that we have embodied in the public health code administered by DPH. For the Fenton Well A replacement, modeling of the aquifer had to demonstrate that there would be a reduced impact to the river, otherwise it wouldn't make sense. And then overall consistency with Yukon's plans and with state and local plans of conservation and development. Unfortunately, the groundwater alternatives did not meet the criteria. Um, they didn't meet the yield criteria. There's been a lot of discussion over the past 10 years, where could we drill in Mansfield, where could we look, let's poke some holes by the Willimantic River, by Mansfield Hollow Lake. Uh, that all culminated with some testing that was finally done over the past couple of years, and the results were sadly not as many had desired. But it is what it is when you drill a well, sometimes you don't get the yield that you need. So I want to talk about the three alternatives that were advanced further in the EIE. Interconnection with the Connecticut Water Company is the first one I'm going to have presented them of the next three. For this alternative, water would come from the Schnipset Reservoir, which is in uh, Ellington, um, Tolland, Vernon, sort of straddles the town lines. With increased capacity from that water treatment plant, 
Now, existing wells in Enfield, Summers, and East Windsor would need to be restored to prior capacities. Now, what this means is that there are already wells that are registered with DEP in those towns, and they're producing a little bit less than they used to historically. So, if those wells can produce what they used to be producing a little bit more, those areas would not need as much water from Shinipsit, then water from Shinipsit could go towards Yukon. So it's an offset. Think of it as an offset. So a pipeline would be installed along Route 195 from Tallinn to Mansfield. There'd be a short segment where there's a shared water main with the Tallinn Water Department, which is great. It cuts down costs. It also reduces the duplication of water mains in a road. Now, cold water releases from the Shinipsit Reservoir would continue. There are cold water releases from Shinipsit Reservoir right now at Connecticut Water Company uh, manages, and that would continue, and eventually it would be supplanted by the stream flow regulations, which would, would require sort of a different timing of releases, but they would still continue. Now, the MDC option um, has some similarities and some differences. Water would come from the Barkhamsted and Nepog reservoirs using existing registered capacities with DEP and existing treatment plant capacities, so there wouldn't be any expansion of treatment plants in Bloomfield and West Hartford. There would be the same same treatment plants that are operational now would still be operational. The pipeline would be installed one of two different routes from East Hartford along I-84. So that would go through Manchester, a tiny corner of South Windsor, near Vernon and Tolland to Mansfield, or um, along 384 through Manchester, through Bolton and Coventry to Mansfield. <coughs> Similar to the Connecticut Water Company alternative, cold water releases would continue in the west branch of the Farmington River. Uh, the Hockenham and the Farmington River are both um, I don't know a better way to say this, they're both managed streams. In Connecticut, we have a lot of managed streams. They are both rivers that depend on cold water releases. So these releases would continue into the future. Winter Waterworks has some similarities, some differences. Um, it is the closest of the three water utilities. The water treatment plant is actually located in southern Mansfield. So water would come from the Willamantic Reservoir, which is a reservoir that does not have a lot of active storage, unlike Barkhamsted, Nepog, and Shinipsit. The Willamantic Reservoir is sort of a run of the river impoundment. It's just there's a dam that raises head and the water passes into the, into the plant. So a pipeline would be installed northerly along Route 195 from southern Mansfield to the stores area. A new tank would be needed in southern Mansfield to balance hydraulics in the Wyndham system because the Wyndham tank is actually in the south part of uh, Willamantic in the town of Wyndham on a hill out that way. So there would need to be some storage in southern Mansfield. When and Waterworks has indicated, we've met with them that they would require removal of sediment from the reservoir to help manage water quality, something that we don't have a good handle about how much sediment would be required to be removed, but we have made some estimates in the EIE document. Now, the Natchar River is the river that flows out of the Willamantic Reservoir and also out of the Mansfield Hollow Lake, which is upstream of Willamantic Reservoir. The Natchar River would experience a decrease in flows, arguably, unless the Army Corps were to manage releases differently from Mansfield Hollow Lake, which is something that, frankly, can't be controlled within the confines of the EIE or by Yukon. So whereas NBC and Connecticut Water Company can manage releases, when the Waterworks doesn't have that control over the Army Corps, they're sort of at the mercy of what comes out of that dam. So, uh, in summary, there are three alternatives that are technically feasible, and they are presented in the EIE. The costs have been uh, tabulated there in the EIE as well. Um, and that's where I kind of want to end because I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about what's in the document. I think everyone's had a chance to look at that. I wanted to really explain how we got to this point. It's important to note that all of the feasible, all, all three of these feasible alternatives will be further evaluated with regard to environmental impacts. That's happening right now as we receive comments. There will be responses to the comments. And there are separate analysis go going on right now uh, relative to cost, financing, and the schedule. So these are all things to be taken into account. And um, this is not done tonight. This uh, public comment continues to the 31st. There will be some time, perhaps a month or two, where we're responding to comments, and then these analyses will continue. I think Jason mentioned how to uh, how to get comments over to his office. Here's his contact information. Um, and with that, you know, we're not going to answer technical questions tonight because we're going to do it all at once when the comments are over. But we're here to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Thank you, David. <coughs> Just to reiterate, um, we have a lot of comments here. I got uh, 41 so far that have signed up, so we do want to move this along. We will be using a three-minute rule. Um, as David mentioned, 
if there are technical questions or policy questions, we're probably going to have to refrain from addressing those directly tonight. Uh, all questions tonight and comments, uh, you know, verbally tonight, verbally at the previous hearing or that I received written, uh, will be addressed uh, as we uh, complete the EAE. Uh, historically, typically, we do uh, a new appendix to the EAE where all the comments are listed and where the responses addressed directly. <coughs> typically, if the EAE needs to be revised in accordance, uh, you know, to accommodate the comments, It'll be clearly indicated as such in a revised version of the EIE. Uh, maybe the text will be a different font or something of that nature. And those documents will again be uh, available to the public, not necessarily for comment, but as a final document. Uh, that revised EIE and the comments um, also form the basis of a record of decision. It's a uh, formal document that the Yukon Board of Trustees must approve. Um, once the EIE is completely final. Um, that record of decision with the board approval goes to the Connecticut Office of Policy and Management and where they need to verify that we've uh, followed the process and issue a determination of adequacy. Uh, one final note, uh, as we address these comments, um, we will also be concurrently looking for answers to questions and issues that the EIE did not address nor was intended to. Uh, there are going to be several questions with respect to financing the options, legal questions um, that the EIE was, not, again, not intended nor did it address. And UConn is currently seeking counsel to help us answer those questions. That will be on a concurrent path as we answer the questions to receive the comments. That said, we'll kick off the hearing tonight. As I mentioned before, we will allow uh, municipal officials, uh, also if there are state legislators here who wish to um, speak uh, first, we will certainly allow them to do so. Um, yes, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Hampton? Yes. Yes, would you like to uh, sure. start the comments? Yeah. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak this evening. I'm John Hampton, State Representative, representing uh, Simsbury, the 16th District, in the Connecticut General Assembly. I, I'm here to express my opposition to the MDC's proposal to divert water from the Farmington River to the University of Connecticut and stores. The Farmington River is a precious natural resource, the watershed providing 100% of the drinking water for over 600,000 people living in Greater Hartford and the Farmington Valley. The watershed is an important Atlantic salmon restoration habitat. Annually, over 1 million juvenile salmon, called salmon fry, are stocked at the watershed. The Farmington River is host to 12 species of freshwater mussels and the southern New England stronghold of dwarf wedge mussels. In addition, there is a multitude of wildlife that depend on the river for its sustainability. I firmly believe that water diversion from the Farmington River is first and foremost not environmentally sound and speaks to the need for a meaningful and substantive statewide water plan. Towns in the Farmington Valley and the Capital Region work very hard to plan and act on a regional basis. The MDC proposal seeks a massive transport, transfer of resources from one part of the state to another without any thoughtful plan. Yukon should not be able to launch such a huge project in a vacuum. The Farmington River is already at risk, water flow is low, and water temperature is high. Climate change has already taken its toll. This is not the time to take away more water and make it more vulnerable to the additional climate change challenges that we know are coming. An incremental gallon of water drawn by the MDC is a gallon of water that is not available to sustain the river. Fisheries and recreational uses have already been affected or in further danger. Trout fishing was suspended last year as low water level levels and high water temperatures threatened fish survival even though weather, weather conditions were not unusual enough to be classified as a drought. This proposal would go against Connecticut's wise and long-held policy against inter basin transfer. 
extending MDC water through the towns between Manchester and Mansfield would bring development pressures on towns entirely inconsistent with the state's plan of conservation and development. To jeopardize the Farmington River for a project that is not backed by proper planning, not backed by proper scientific and economic analysis, and violates any state environmental policies is wrong. Instead, Connecticut state and local leaders in partnership with lead environmental entities must come together to draft a comprehensive long-term water use plan that addresses the entire state, eliminating the need for short-sighted measures such as the one before us now. <clears throat> to that end, I proposed House Bill number 5478, an act establishing a statewide moratorium for water diversions and requiring the establishment of a statewide water plan. Let us pause and start a constructive dialogue between all parties that results in solutions to water supply challenges that are strategic and environmentally sound. Thank you. You have to excuse my voice. My name is Don Stein. I'm first elected in Park Hampstead. And I have previously submitted comments to UConn regarding some specifics for the town of Park Hampstead, the west branch of the river, Lake McDonough, which is the recreation lake that is fed by, by the Park Hampstead Reservoir. So we'll repeat those. But Mary Glassman is first elected in Simsbury, Dick Barlow, Canton. Selecting Lisa Hamner from Simsbury. And Dan Jerem from New Hartford all have comments. But Mary has put together a letter it represents the 11 towns along the Farmington River, which she will read. It represents uh, the Avon Town Manager, Farmington Town Manager, and the Farmington Town Council, uh, Dick Barlow from Canton, myself, uh, Bill Smith from Granby, Jim Hayden from East Granby, uh, Tom McKean from Colebrook, Ted Schaefer from Burlington, and Dan Jarrell from New Hartford. So I'll let Mary read that letter, and then I think there's a couple of other comments specific from the towns. Thank you, Don. <coughs> Uh, first, I uh, just want to thank UConn for uh, extending the comment period and providing us this opportunity uh, to speak on this issue. Uh, we're very grateful to hold it in our uh, Farmington Valley. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of interest in this issue, and uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to speak, and we appreciate the openness of the process. Uh, secondly, we want to stress that uh, we're glad to see uh, Mayor Betsy Patterson here from Town Mansfield and Town Manager Matt Hart. And uh, we just want to say that we stand uh, to support UConn and the expansion in Mansfield, and uh, we look forward to cooperatively working with you um, to address your water needs. So that's the spirit that we come here tonight. Um, we have uh, met as municipal leaders of the Farmington Valley, and uh, we want to reiterate that we've uh, all submitted previous testimony, and uh, thank you for that opportunity. Uh, we also want you to str strongly urge you to look at the uh, wonderful comments by the Sensory Conservation Commission, uh, which is represented here tonight by our members, um, and also the Terrafield Village Association, which is represented by Wanda Coleman, who's the president of that um, association as well. So all good comments that have already been submitted, but we urge you to take another look um, at those comments. Uh, so tonight, uh, we just wanted to uh, first express our appreciation for having this opportunity, and second, uh, to express our serious concerns uh, for the MDC proposal, which as you stated earlier, is one of three proposals uh, currently being considered uh, to address the water uh, concerns. Uh, we believe that this plan, the MDC plan, will have an adverse impact on the residents of the Farmington Valley towns, and we believe that there are cheaper and better alternatives uh, to address the issues before you. Uh, we also believe that a long-term solution should be put in place before uh, this proposal, uh, or before any 20-mile pipe is installed. Um, as you know, we in the Farmington Valley work very hard uh, to provide regional approaches and reasonable solutions, regional solutions. Um, and in contrast, we feel that this proposal would uh, transfer resources from one part of the state to another uh, without a really thought, thorough, uh, thought-through plan uh, and agreed-to plan. 
I'm not going to read uh, specifically. I have testimony that uh, we are submitting, but uh, we really want you to know that we feel that this uh, plan should be done in the context of a state plan to address the regional water needs and not as a reactive quick fix. Uh, we feel that a plan should not be implemented before a regional analysis and impact study have been completed. Uh, second, we're concerned that this proposal would have a severe environmental effects on the Farmington River, um, and uh, we've uh, identified those in our letter. Uh, third, we're concerned that the proposal is inconsistent with the state plan of conservation and development, and we cited some uh, specific uh, comments on that. Uh, fourth, we suggest that UConn's environmental impact evaluation is not a sufficient basis for decision making. Um, and finally, uh, what we really want to stress is that the Farmington River is already under stress. And the MDC proposal will only make the situation worse. Uh, we feel that our Farmington River is an important resource uh, for fisheries, for canoeing, for kayaking, for tubing, as well as an important process in the uh, sewage treatment plant, the way we treat our sewage. Uh, we know that the upper river is already designated wild and scenic, and we have a pending designation for the lower river. So we really want you to take another look at this third proposal to evaluate the other two proposals that we feel are viable proposals and uh, that we <coughs> like a plan that's supported by proper planning, proper scientific and economic analysis, and one that doesn't violate state environmental policy. Uh, we look forward to working with you on the alternatives, and uh, we look forward to supporting University of Connecticut and your development needs. Thank you very much. Good evening, I'm Dick Barlow, first selectman of Town of Canton. I previously submitted uh, comments for the record, and uh, I'm sure that uh, you'll be addressing those. One technical uh, question I would uh, suggest is that uh, you're talking about finishing the uh, EIE after you receive comments. I think that the uh, number of people here tonight and their concern certainly warrants those comments coming back and being re-vetted uh, in front of the public and not uh, once the comments are done. That, project goes on without further opportunity to this group to uh, see the uh, recommendations and conclusions you've drawn based on the information provided. <clears throat> I was really uh, pleased tonight to hear for the first time some detail about the uh, water reduction, reuse, and conservation efforts at UConn. Uh, I think uh, personally that's a critical first step that uh, needs to be uh, looked at before you uh, look at uh, further enhancements to your supply. <laughs> that being said, uh, I'm a little bit disappointed when I look in EIE and it talks about UConn's needs to include recreational uh, items such as uh, intramural flag football fields. Uh, the use of water for such uh, activities, recreational activities, it potentially at the expense of the Farmington River in the future, uh, which is designated wild and scenic, and we know a tremendous recreational resource, I think is in stark contrast to the reality, and I hope that uh, those kind of things would be taken out of uh, the water equation for what UConn's uh, needs may be in the, in the future. But with respect to the uh, MDC option, we obviously understand that they do have existing capacity within their Nipog and Barkhampton uh, reservoir systems and their treatment facilities at this time uh, to, to provide the water. We question the wisdom of uh, such a massive diversion from the Farmington Basin to the Thames Fenton Basin. Uh, we think that's inconsistent with the plan of conservation development. As many people said, we hope that uh, that is given more, more attention. Uh, we are further deeply concerned that while MDC has existing capacity, uh, they have a rather extensive service area at this time and we feel that that capacity should be reserved for that growth within that service area, not expanding the surface area. And as much as uh, they've said that they have no intention of affecting the cold water releases on the west branch of the Farmington River, you need to look no further than MDC's strategic plan, which is on their website, which underwater indicates that one of their goals is to access the west branch of the Farmington River for water supply. So while it's not a threat or an issue tonight, uh, we clearly know that that's going to come somewhere down the road. Is it 10, 15, 20 years down the road? Uh, we know it's going to come, and we should make all provisions at this time to preclude, preclude that from being necessary. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, bear with me while I come to grips with this large crowd. I'm Dan Jerram. I'm the first selectman of the town of New Hartford, where these reservoirs in the Farmington River are located, uh, along with uh, the town of Canton, our sister communities, uh, Park Hampstead and the Farmington Valley Towns. We're here to express our concern, not necessarily against the MDC proposal, who are uh, great partners with us out in New Hartford. They're our largest landowner and our largest taxpayer, and what I feel are good stewards of the land. We're here to express our concern entirely about the process as a whole. Uh, we here in New Hartford are concerned that all the available options have yet to really receive the benefit of adequate research and sufficient public discussion so that the pros and cons of each of the three alternative plans can adequately be understood by all the impacted parties, especially the people of the town of New Hartford. I attended the uh, public information uh, session in Farmington last week and was uh, happy to hear about the MDC uh, proposal and to learn more about that, but I was disappointed not to, to hear from the other two competing proposals. It's difficult for us in one side of the state to come to grips and try to develop an informed decision when we're only hearing one piece of the puzzle. Uh, you know, like I said, the MDC are great partners with the town of New Hartford, and uh, we like the relationship that we have. That said, our, our residents remain concerned with any proposal that would seek to change the status quo and possibly threaten, however remotely, the environmental balance of the watershed lands in our com uh, community and the reservoirs and rivers that they help sustain. If you know the lay of the land in New Hartford, the Barker Campstead Reservoir supplies Lake McDonough, which is home to Stancliffe Cove, Bark Campstead and New Hartford's shared municipal beach. Uh, any significant diversion there may threaten the reserves that help support our town beach. Uh, you know, we think that uh, without thorough research and uh, without any more data, we're, we are, are unable to answer the question whether our concerns are warranted or not. Uh, the Farmington River, beyond the reservoirs, is an integral part of our New Hartford's quality of life. We enjoy the canoeing and the kayaking and the tubing and of course the world-class fishing uh, that is provided from the wild and scenic river. Uh, but uh, it, it's a little bit more than that to the people of the town of New Hartford. We, like the towns of Simsbury, uh, rely on the river for our wastewater treatment, and we also have uh, dual franchise rights to, to draw water in the underground subterranean for the people that live along the Route 44 corridor. Any significant change or alteration to how the water flows through our town is a source of concern for the people that live and uh, have their homes in that area. So again, without the research to know, we're just uh, unsure about what this will bring to all of us. Uh, I think that uh, I, like most New Hartford residents, share the desire for uni the university officials to uh, appropriately plan for the future infrastructure needs of our flagship university uh, so that current and future students have all the tools they need to compete in the world economy. Uh, that said, we in New Hartford are concerned that the research uh, completed to date is inadequate uh, for us to make an informed decision. So on behalf of the people of the town of New Hartford, uh, I would respectfully request that university officials look beyond the existing EIE, continue to conduct research as to the impact of the three alternative plans, and improve the public discourse specifically to include the Farmington River towns, so that when this process is complete, we'll all be confident that the best interest of all have been considered, and the option that is ultimately selected will serve the people of the state of Connecticut well into the future. Thank you. Lisa Hevner, the Board of Selectmen in Simsbury. Um, first of all, thank you for hosting this hearing. It's much appreciated. And uh, Mary, thank you for writing the letter requesting it. Uh, this came from our Board of Selectmen meeting. We felt that we needed a hearing within the Farmington Valley, and we appreciate you coming to us. Um, I also want to thank everyone who is here in the audience. It is so wonderful to see so many faces that I know. When people say, um, our country is apathetic, that nobody cares anymore tonight, we know that that's not true. So thank everyone for being here. The one point I want to make, in addition to all the wonderful points that have made so far, is that we are from the Farmington Valley. The river defines us. We have been stewards of it since the 1600s. 
and we plan on being stewards of the valley and the river for hundreds of years to come. So this is more than just about how to fund Yukon. This is our heritage, this is our history, and this is our future. So as you think about that, I ask you to keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you for hosting this important public hearing. Uh, my name is Kevin Wickos, and I serve as the state senator from the 8th Senatorial District, which includes 11 towns, many of which surround the east and west banks of the Farmington River and are home to the Nipah and Barcampton Reservoirs. I'm here this evening to urge your reconsideration and rejection of the environmental impact evaluation for potential water supply sources for Yukon and the town of Mansfield. Since this EIE has become known to local officials and area residents, I've received many phone calls and emails concerned with what this project would do to the Farmington River and their communities at large. As you're well aware, the Farmington River is not only a great natural resource, but throughout the year serves as an active venue for kayaking, fishing, bird watching, and many other recreational uses. But additionally, the Farmington River serves an important functional manner as well, as many water pollution control authorities are situated along the river and depend on a certain water flow ratio. Any negative environmental impact, including the loss of water to the river, is simply unacceptable. We must be mindful of the consequences of man-made diversions along the entire length of the river. I disagree with the findings in the report which suggests that the Farmington River could be one of the three possibilities for alternative water supplies with minimal environmental impact. We're told that the river basins have a capacity of 52 billion gallons and that the transfer of 3 million additional gallons per day will be inconsequential. However, one needs to only visit the Farmington River on an average mid-July day to see how low the level water is and at times walkable from one shore to the next. This particular EIE fails to consider the impact of the communities along the river and instead focuses on the communities where water distribution lines would be constructed. The Farmington River is very much a part of the EIE it is unfortunate that serious consideration of all communities along the river were not made a part of the evaluation process despite the many specific areas of focus in the EIE. As an elected official, this is both frustrating to me and quite frankly shows a lack of respect to the residents in those communities that I represent as well to the keepers of the waterways and river basins they so lovingly protect. Also, my understanding that this recommendation would violate the state plan of conservation and development with the passage of pipeline through locations defined as conservation areas, including one in the town of Coventry, where rural land and conservation areas comprise most of the corridor. And you can find that on page 6 of section 12 of the EIE. The plan goes on to state that the state policy is to avoid extension of water systems in these areas. Additionally, the EIE report highlights the fact that several hundred new homes could be developed in three towns to which the pipeline would be constructed. The towns of Bolton, Coventry, and Tallinn could see as many as 900 new homes developed, meaning a greater need for water resources which are not addressed in this report and raise serious concerns about future development and water resource planning. I am further concerned that this project is sought not only to provide a much needed water supply for Yukon, its current usage, and a readily available water supply for the expansion, as well as to the town of Mansfield for its economic growth. But there is no protection to the limit of gallons that will be transferred from water sources west of the Connecticut River. While I understand that additional permission would be needed to gain access to the water flow, it would make further supply determinations much easier once the pipeline is in place. If this project is solely intended for the Yukon campus and the town of Mansfield, then I would urge, at the very least, bond covenants that expressly prohibit additional taps or extensions for water usage other than the initial identification of usages. While there are three recommended options for additional water supply, this is the only one that I believe draws from what could be a historic river which has a federal designation as wild and scenic. In closing, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify and I do believe public participation in such a large-scale project is very important. 
With that said, and given the issues I've highlighted, I respectfully ask you to reject the EIE evaluations MDC proposal and additionally study the impact on all the towns along the Farmington River should this proposal be the one that's chosen for additional water supply. A complete report with the full scope of any environmental and economic impact on all communities and safeguards of additional expansion should be presented to all the communities and participation from those communities should be considered. I hope this action will bring a resolution that we can all agree on. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Matt Hart, town manager for the town of Mansfield, and I'm joined here this evening by Betsy Patterson, our mayor. Uh, thank you all uh, for coming here this evening. Uh, we, we've been following the commentary regarding the draft EIE, and there are a few key issues that we'd like to address on behalf of the town of Mansfield. Uh, the, the first issue concerns Mansfield's involvement an interest in the EIE and in the larger water supply uh, project. For several years now, we, the town, we've been working to bring water and sewer service to our Four Corners commercial area. And if you're familiar with Mansfield and Yukon, that's the commercial area in the vicinity of the intersection of Routes 195 and, uh, and Route 44. So we've been working on this for some time, and during this period, we've also identified a need uh, to, to provide water to a planned independent slash assisted living facility in Mansfield, as well as future development that would be in accordance with our plan of conservation and development. When funding for Yukon's Technology Park was announced in 2011, we saw an opportunity really to, to work collaboratively with Yukon on, on a joint uh, water supply initiative that would allow us to really choose an option that would meet both of our needs and allow us to pool our, our resources together, if you will. So that, that's one point we wanted to cover. Uh, a second point that we wanted to address is, is this perception that the town and the university have already selected the MDC as the preferred alternative or as the only option. Uh, that's that. That's simply simply not accurate. Uh, from from the town's perspective, the EIE has identified three, you know, three interconnection alternatives that we can consider: uh, the Wyndham Waterworks, the Connecticut Water Company, and uh, and the MDC option. Wyndham and the Connecticut wa Water options are indeed viable. In fact, some of our own Mansfield commissions and advisory committees have ranked those ahead of the, of the MDC option. So they, they are real, they are viable. Uh, also, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that my colleagues at, at the University of Connecticut have had several conversations with them, we work together uh, all the time, that they're committed, they're committed to performing a thorough analysis to, to look at all three options in, uh, in detail. And the last point that we want to make is that the town of Mansfield, you know, we certainly respect the importance and the value of the MDC and the Shenipset Lake Reservoirs, you know, all those water bodies, uh, the Nabisatuck Lake, our own Nabisatuck Lake in Mansfield and Wyndham, the Farmington River, certainly, as well as any other water source that would be potentially impacted here. You know, Mansfield, we've got a long history. We're, we're proud of our commitment to sustainability. We're proud of our history of, of strong conservation and intelligent land use uh, practices and principles. So our objective, we want to continue to work collaboratively with Yukon. We want to identify a water supply option that is number one, environmentally responsible, economically feasible, and is otherwise acceptable to the town the university, the region, 
and uh, the state as a whole. So a as a key partner in this EIE process, it's important for the mayor and I, for the town, to hear from interested parties and citizens. So certainly pleased that you all turned out this evening. We appreciate the opportunity to address the issues that we noted, and thank you again for scheduling this public hearing. My name is Liz Dolphin, I'm the Assistant Town Planner for the Town of Farmington. I've been asked to um, read letters uh, into the record for uh, both our town manager, uh, Kathy Egan, and the chairman of our uh, town council, Jeffrey Holgan. Um, I'd like to read the first letter just to put it in context. It already was submitted on December 21st um, for this process, but I would just like to read that. Uh, this letter is to serve as a comment to the EIE for the University of Connecticut Additional Sources of Water Supply. While the town of Farmington understands the university's need to expand their water supply and appreciates the efforts taken to determine all possible options, we have serious concerns with alternative number, number four, interconnection with the Metropolitan District Commission. This alternative calls for a significant diversion of water from the Farmington River watershed in western Connecticut to the Thames River watershed in eastern Connecticut. Not only is this an extensive interwater connection, watershed diversion, which is discouraged in multiple state and regional plans, but the approximately 20 miles of new pipeline will also open the MDC to new demands beyond the Connecticut River watershed without a more thorough and current evaluation of its own watershed's future water supply and ecological needs. The Farmington River is too great a resource to both our region and the state of Connecticut <coughs> as a whole to allow the infrastructure for significant future withdrawals to be established without completely understanding both the anticipated needs and the resulting impacts. It is my understanding that following issues have been determined or reviewed. Yukon and Mansfield have jo jointly identified a need for approximately two MGD of additional water the supply will enable them to satisfy area needs and maintain sufficient margin of safety, including maintaining required operation, operating constraints on the Fenton River wells. An EIE assessed various supply options and concluded draft that groundwater is not feasible, but water main extensions from Connecticut Water Company, Wyndham Water, and MDC remain viable alternatives. It is our understanding that the CWC alternative, five miles, is the least cost overall construction and utility operating expense, and arguably has the least environmental impact associated with it. The MDC alternative is, in, is inconsistent with state policy, including state and local plans of conservation and development, the Upper Connecticut River Water Utility Coordinating Committee's a coordinated plan, and even MDC's own individual water <coughs> supply plan. We agree that there is a need to improve the water supply for Yukon. However, we do not agree with the proposal to extract water from the Farmington River watershed and transfer to, into another watershed nearly 20 miles away when there is a prudent and feasible alternative. The alternative is considerably less intrusive, not only to the environment, but the overall distribution to install uh, that amount of water main piping. Thank you for your consideration. Sincerely, Kathleen A. Egan. The se second letter I'd like to read is from our chairman of our town council, uh, Jeffrey Hogan. Uh, both could not be here tonight. Uh, they both are in uh, budget meetings for the town. So, uh, Dear Mr. Coy, this correspondence relates to the EIE for the Yukon Additional Source of Water Supply. I serve as the chief elected official for the town of Farmington. Kathleen Egan, our town manager, has sent you correspondence dated December 21, 2012, which I just read. 
which details our concerns about this issue. I'm writing to reiterate some of these concerns and to point out a few additional issues surrounding the way that this issue has been communicated. Please note that we have serious concerns around Alternative 4. The proposed interwatershed proposal will have a dramatic <coughs> effect on the Farmington River. Further, there is inadequate data analyzing the short and long-term impacts to the Farmington. The Farmington River is an extremely important environmental and financial resource for the town of Farmington and other Farmington Valley towns. The proposed project will not well was not well communicated <coughs> to the towns in the valley. In fact, we indirectly heard of this proposal only a few weeks ago, and only by happenstance. I'm very <coughs> pleased that the comment period was extended until January 31st, but I'll tell you that most of our town residents are still unaware of the issue and details of the project and its various alternatives. Most of the Farmington Valley towns rely on the Farmington River Watershed Association for information on these issues, potentially affecting the Farmington River. Most of the towns actu actually allocate monies to support this their advocacy and educational efforts. I'm amazed to learn that the MDC has effectively silenced this organization relative to comments on this EIE. This action clear clearly impedes an open and public process for gathering comments, including, concluded with this letter, I've copied the Farmington for Watersheds comments to its memberships describing its impediment to advocacy. I believe the, the MDC Alternative 4 runs contrary to state and local plans of conservation and development. Clearly there is a need to improve the water supply for Yukon, but to suggest that running 20 miles of costly water mains across the state to the farming, from the Farmington River to draw millions of gallons of water from this river seems rather silly and costly. In fact, it is my belief that the non-members MDC towns will bear much of the capital costs associated with infrastructure extension. Each town or region in Connecticut assumed to operate and depend upon its own watershed. Political subdivisions have all created and implemented in-depth plans of conservation and development which support and substantiate these plans. The state of Connecticut, likewise, has established policy via its own plan of conservation. The MDC proposal makes extensive ex excess capacity water assumptions for our watershed to benefit MDC in another watershed. There is no current data to support these assumptions. It is clear that the town of Mansfield hasn't even requested additional water supply. It is also clear that the MDC is looking for additional consumers. I am particularly concerned that the MDC is looking to capitalize its expansion plans via non-member consumers. There is a large disparity between and among the water rates charged to member communities versus non-member communities. Noting in this proposal asserts current empirical evidence addressing the current or future needs of the valley relative to development or growth. The Farmington River is a gem. The Farmington already suffers from innumerable adverse impacts, including lower water flow and higher water temperatures. That is a bad proposal. There appear to be alternatives that are more appropriate. I thank you for considering my comments. Sincerely, Jeffrey J. <coughs> My name is David Loomy, 11 Muskie <laughs> Trail, Simsbury, Connecticut. I am, this is a letter that I have previously sent to uh, Mr. Coyne. I am an environmentalist, fly fisherman, kayaker, and most of all, a Connecticut taxpayer. I am here to speak against the MDC proposal to transfer 17 million pounds of water per day from the Farmington River watershed to Mansfield, Connecticut. There are many reasons why I believe this proposal is a bad idea and bad environmental practice. Some of these reasons include, first, 
the data upon which the EIE and the MDC's assumptions are based are significantly out of date. The EIE uses a study of flow data on the Farmington River from 1970 to 1990. That is 22 years ago. Look at what happened in 2012. The west branch of the Farmington River was nearly dry. And last year was not the only low flow year. 2010, 2007, 2005, 2002 were also very low levels of water in the west branch and elsewhere in Connecticut. We are only beginning to see the effects of climate change. We can all agree that significant changes have happened in the Farmington watershed over the last 22 years, and the changes to come will probably be even greater. We need to look ahead and plan for water usage in all parts of the state. Number two, the MDC proposal violates state policy. It does not conform to the State Conservation and Development Policies Plan, which states, quote, that large interbasin transfers should be avoided if at all possible. End quote. How can this policy be ignored? The university should be ashamed to even consider such a flagrant violation of state policy when other options exist. Number three, the statewide planning policy which exists for water supply is the Water Utility Coordinating Committee, WUCC, which has never been done for the Northeast Water Supply Management Area, which includes the university in the town of Mansfield. To entertain the idea of transporting millions of gallons of water per day from one part of the state to another without having done a full regional plan sounds like a shortcut to me. Where is responsibility of the University of Connecticut Board of Trustees? This is too fast a decision that would have permanent damage to the environment of both parts of the state. Four, the list of organizations that have voiced concerns over the MDC proposal is long and growing. The list includes the Rivers Alliance of Connecticut, the National Park Service, Central Connecticut Regional Planning Council, Trout Unlimited, Wyndham Regional Council of Governments, Council of Environmental Quality, Willimantic River Alliance, the communities of Simsbury, Avon, Farmington, Granby, East Granby, and others in the Farmington Valley and throughout Connecticut. I recommend that the concerns expressed by each of these organizations be considered in the process. Thank you. I believe that I speak for the citizens of Connecticut who recognize that profits should not come before the fragile environment of the state. The university exists for the entire state, and the Board of Trustees has an obligation to all regions of the state and not just to one area. If this proposal does not go forward, I plan to organize a campaign of citizens who will protest to the University of Board of Trustees. This proposal should not go forward. Thank you. Jason for letting me speak. Uh, in addition to my day job, I'm the, uh, first of all, I'm Jim Glowenka. In addition to my day job, I'm the uh, state chairman for the Connecticut Council of Trout Unlimited. For those of you that don't know Trout Unlimited, we're a nationwide organization, 53 years old, 150,000 members across the country, 450 chapters, I think 35 states. In Connecticut, I oversee the volunteer work of 3,500 members. Uh, some of the officers, uh, in eight chapters, and some of the officers and members are here tonight. Now, um, I want to express my concerns about the proposal in general and some comments on alternative number four, uh, but I also want to offer some suggestions. I'm going to summarize a letter which I will have to review with my council tomorrow night at our quarterly meeting, uh, but I want to summarize just three points that I think may be helpful in this discussion. Okay. Um, those three points fit a category, I would say, statewide systems view of the problem and the solution. And the first of those is we actually were the first state in this country to pass stream flow regulations, legislation I should say, in 2006 in the process of promulgating those regulations. The key principle and policy behind those regulations will be no degradation of our river flows. Any regulation being proposed and adopted is supposed to at least keep rivers where they are, if not allow them to get better. Okay? And I'm concerned that um, 
this particular proposal is not going to allow us to do that. It's just going to conflict with that legislation by risking the adequate future flows for the west branch of the Farmington, certainly, but as well as some of the more immediate flows in the other related rivers. So that's the, the Connecticut stream flow concern that I have. And that does pretty much focus on alternative number four. Also focusing on number four is another point that I'd like to introduce, and I've introduced this in testimony to Hartford in the past. Water companies like the energy companies are going to have to change their business model. Just because they want to grow their bottom line doesn't mean they have to sell more water. If you look at what's happened in the oil business and the electric business, for which I've done some consulting, if you convince people that this is a scarce resource, they should be willing to preserve it and pay more for it. I don't see that in the, the uh, um, what the MDC has in their, um, in their strategic plan. If I look at their business mission and strategy, it suggests that they continue to focus on stimulating demand over fostering conservation. I don't believe this is a good bandwagon for, for UConn to jump on, and it creates a dependency for the school on a partner with what I believe is a going out of business strategy. Now, the third comment I want to make really is of more general nature, and it's, it goes to the root of what TU does across the country. Given the speed that this proposal has been pushed and the lack of transparency that many of you have already spoken about in engaging all affected parties, I cannot give this initiative much chance of success as it's currently proceeding. TU's growing success across the country working on projects in collaboration with water authorities, municipalities, power generators, agricultural agencies, farm, uh, farmers, and so forth, clearly demonstrates that positive outcomes are available when all stakeholders' interests across the state of Connecticut in this case, are part of the solution. In the water short west, TU has increasingly been part of groundbreaking initiatives that brought together parties traditionally on opposite sides of the table to come up with incredibly successful water-based projects that benefit everyone. So, I think we have an opportunity here for a solution <coughs> that involves collaboration, constructive dialogue with all the stakeholders, not just those in Manfield, but across the state of Connecticut. Thank you very much. received correspondence from our town manager and uh, town council as well as uh, they've been read into the record uh, this evening. Uh, as a commission, uh, we concur with, with those conclusions. Our commission is mandated by Farmington's regulations and ordinances to carry out and effectuate the purposes and policies to promote the development and conservation of natural resources, including water resources within the town of Farmington. Our commission is tasked bi-monthly with many projects that promote development, and one of many ways, one of many of our considerations is watershed protection efforts and watershed conservation. Our toolbox focuses on buffer management, earth-friendly gardens and landscapes, minimal use of power equipment uh, to reduce or eliminate the use of pesticides, chemicals, and fertilizers, prevent pollution, basically of our drinking water, aquifers, rivers, lakes, and ponds. We do these things with the support and help of local, state, federal governments and their officials. River conservation, water, watersh <coughs> watershed aquifer recharge are our highest priority. We can't live without water either. Statutes and regulations discourage these types of actions, such as NBC's interconnection proposals. It is counter to several state statutes, uh, G, G, S, I'm sorry, CGS 2533 and RCS section 2533 as well. The NBC proposal, as described, will impact stormwater systems, bridges and culverts along the uh, pipeline right away, 
additional energy, electricity, natural gas demands for this project scope to move the water over these uh, distances. Direct wetlands impacts along the pipeline way as it passes the wetland, watercourses, and vegetative areas. We have significant concerns about <clears throat> we have significant concerns of this MDC project impact to our town and state resources and the removal of water from our watershed uh, for the sole purpose of expansion of MDC's territory out of our river basin with water and other <coughs> sanitary services. This project is not a wise use. For us, <clears throat> a wise use alternative for us, and goes against all that we stand for as a conservation commission. Please look at the other alternatives. Thank you. Val Rossetti. I'm a member of the Bloomfield Conservation Energy and Environment Committee. I'm speaking on their behalf. We want to express our opposition to the MDC uh, water diversion proposal. And in light of the fact that Bloomfield is one of the eight member um, MDC towns and also has part of the Farmington River on its border, we want to express our serious concerns. They are very similar to what's been expressed earlier tonight. Um, although the MDC asserts that up to 5 million gallons of water excess a day for Yukon and Mansfield in one of its larger plans will always be within the limits of, the, of its excess capacity of 12 million gallons um, without affecting the Farmington River, um, the analysis seems to be based on uh, flow rates from the 1970 to 1990s and no consideration is given for um, possible extenuating climactic conditions which are becoming more the norm than, um, uh, than the extreme. And should the drought, should drought conditions affect the entire watershed, this margin of water um, supply may not be enough to supply both the needs of the MDC towns uh, Mansfield, Yukon, um, and to protect the flow rates in the Farmington River. Uh, the MDC proposal involves constructing the 17 miles of pipeline, which the own, their own um, executive summary noted, notes um, may cause unavoidable adverse environmental impacts along the possible route of some of the pipelines. And the expansion of the water supply may well spur the development of sprawl across existing agricultural lands. It's unclear whether all these uh, areas would conform to the state conservation and development plan. One additional note is that uh, additional energy will be required to uh, filter, treat, and pump the water in the MDC plant since it's the lowest and furthest away. We'll ultimately use the greatest amount of energy over um, the timeline. Two additional proposals, as people have noted, are already present, uh, both of which are more economically feasible and less the MDC does a 30-year life cycle uh, plan analysis, which, again, we know, uh, given the climate conditions, it's not really clear who has the information on what will be happening 30 years from now. And in addition, there's um, no real need for the MDC to expand. It's a regional nonprofit company, so we're not sure what it, uh, what, whether it should be involved at all in a massive infrastructure development project. Due to these concerns, the Bloomfield Conservation Energy and Environment Committee expresses its opposition to the MDC proposal on an interbasin uh, water transfer and um, thinks that regional water planning in conjunction with land use, transportation, and energy planning should be completed for northeastern Connecticut prior to any major new water commitments and specifically before consideration of this proposal. Thank you. Good 
Good evening. Um, I'm Susan Messino, and I'm sp spokesperson for a community group called Keep the Woods, where a lot of people have spent an enormous amount of time, effort, and money um, protecting 400 acres on top of an aquifer that's part of the Farmington River watershed. So um, I'm not officially here in that capacity, but I can say pretty confidently that although we didn't take a vote, you could add Keep the Woods to one of the groups that um, has an opinion on this issue. I'm also a professor of neuroscience at Trinity College and an adjunct professor of neuroscience at the Yukon Health Center and an adjunct of pharmacology and therapeutics at the Yukon Stores campus. And um, I'm not at all against technology or bioscience. I work on uh, multiple federally funded grants for my research. However, before I moved to Connecticut, I lived in Colorado and in California and I'm getting a very stomach-turning sense of deja vu right now. <laughs> when they built tech parks on both of those campuses at those universities. And just to tell you um, one story from University of California where there was the campus and there was one beautiful part of campus that was undeveloped and was still kind of a little bit of ranch land where they had some pastures, they had a couple horses, they had a 4-H farm and a bunch of really nice amenities on that part of campus. Well, one day they had a vote for a rec center. Well, I'm not against recreation either, so I voted for the rec center. And sure enough, they were going to put the rec center just on one little part of that area of campus. Next thing I know, you see this big thing marching over the hill, and I said, well, what's going on with that? Oh, that's a water line. Well, what's that for? That's for the rec center. And I said, okay, are you sure it's only for the rec center? Yeah, it's just for the rec center. <laughs> Well, let's just tell you right now, none of those things are still there. The 4-H farm, none of that land, it's all embalmed palm trees and concrete. So what started as just a water line did not end up like that. and was a complete sprawl generating development in an area where there was no infrastructure originally. So I'm just worried that this plan is kind of a copycat tech center approach that's being pursued. And um, I really think the entire plan, both the tech center and the water resources, really requires a lot of creative thought and multiple inputs to do something that's really going to benefit the university and benefit the state as a whole. And <clears throat> these kind of solutions really require a lot of input, input and thought. And often, you know, the simplest solution doesn't consider a lot of collateral costs. Um, to farmland, to a big interbasin transfer of water, risking a healthy watershed, and doesn't consider collateral economic benefits which could occur if the development was diverted into a different area, which might already have some interest infrastructure. And after working for many years to move back to New England, um, it really makes me sad that we're considering this plan in Connecticut, which is generally a very thoughtful state. And I'm hoping that um, we can really pursue the best solution <clears throat> which will benefit the state as a whole and not look at the solution in isolation um, based on money, but look at all of the costs and benefits and collateral issues and furthermore, focus on a solution which keeps the water supply within the same basin. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lauren Savage, and I am an attorney with Connecticut Fund for the Environment. Our comments tonight are brief, but we will be submitting written comments at a later date. We are concerned with the inconsistencies between the MDC alternative and the state conservation and development plan. First, <clears throat> the MDC proposal would encourage development because it provides more drinking water than is necessary to meet the um, stated needs in the EIE. The state plan states that water services should only be expanded into rural areas to meet the existing need, and only to meet that existing need in a manner that does not encourage further development. This alternative would pipe more water than is necessary through conservation, through undeveloped conservation areas, and this will can only attract more development in these undeveloped areas. 
the MDC alternative especially is inconsistent with smart growth, smart growth policies. Instead of using existing infrastructure to, in populated areas um, to support development, it proposes new infrastructure in rural areas um, to support a future development plan. Second, the MDC alternative would create a large interbasin transfer that would move water from the west of the state to the east. While MDC has additional surplus um, water in its existing, um, in its existing res reservoirs, this surplus water should not be transferred into another watershed and should instead be used to bolster the Farmington River watershed when it has low stream flows, as we've seen in recent years especially, and can only continue with climate change. Um, for example, the Hartford area has a lot of capacity for growth, and this is in accord with a lot of responsible, sustainable, smart growth principles because it's, it's placing growth and development near populated areas. Um, but this growth cannot happen if water is being transferred out of the Farmington River watershed and instead being transported into rural areas such as near the store's campus. These inconsistencies with the state plan should warrant the proposal's dismissal as an option um, to provide additional water to UConn campus. Thank you. Simsbury. Uh, my uh, written uh, comments that I've submitted this evening deal in some detail with the statements made by the MDC at their information uh, meeting last week. Um, a three-minute limit doesn't permit me to deal with those in any detail. Uh, I think it's sufficient to say that MDC contradicted the EIE in a number of important respects. Uh, they contradicted themselves in a number of important respects. And they really failed to provide any data on the the available amount of water in the East Branch that they say they would be relying upon. So, at the end of all that, we're pretty confused about uh, the supply and demand uh, characteristics of this MDC proposal. But I hope folks will have a chance to look at my written statement. It, it covers a lot, of, a lot of ground. Many good uh, comments have been made already this evening. I think it's sufficient to say that uh, there's good reason to worry about the Farmington River. Uh, in its comments, the National Park Service wrote, quote, Evidence we see on the Farmington River includes recurring summer drought conditions and declining water levels due to decreased rainfall and snow melt and groundwater recharge during critical periods. These factors have not been analyzed or addressed in considering the available water supply in the Farmington Basin. Those quotes. People in the towns uh, on the main stem of the Farmington River are generally of the view that there is not enough water in the river. The uh, December 2012 DEEP Inland Fisheries Memorandum observed that the river segments below the reservoirs, quote, do not meet water quality standards for aquatic life and recreation. Increased withdrawal of 1.93 MGD may further degrade already degraded downstream riverine habitats in both the East Branch Farmington and the Pog Rivers, close quotes. If there is excess water in the East Branch, what does MDC do with it? <laughs> it appears that they top off the reservoirs in the spring and run the excess out the spillways into the river at a time of year when the river does not need the water. Then they draw down the reservoirs during the summer and fall, but not really very much. And then in the spring they top it off again and spill the seasonal excess out the spillway. Here's a suggestion. If the MDC has 5 million gallons per day that it would be comfortable committing to Yukon, why not instead return it to the river in those seasons when the river needs the water? <laughs> if, if there is really 12.6 MGD available, maybe they could do 7 or, or a bit more. Unlike the Yukon deal, this would not be a commitment that might be regretted later if climate change shrank the supply. And it would be much appreciated by the fish, tubers, anglers, 
blue jeans, spurs, and paddlers on the main stem of the river. Section 6.4 of the MDC Charter, relating to the East Branch of the Farmington, provides that MDC may, quote, use any part of the water therein stored, which is not needed for its water supply system, for the purpose of returning to said Farmington River at convenient times, water, for the purpose of maintaining in said river a more constant flow, regardless of seasonal variation, close quotes. Mr. Riger? Yes. We have a number of other commenters that might wish to speak tonight. I welcome you to return at the end and finish your comments. Okay, I'm sorry I didn't notice your side. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Kevin Goff. I'm from Bloomfield. I'm also a member of the Bloomfield Conservation Energy and Environment uh, Committee. Um, uh, Bob Rosetti has already given the opinion of that committee. My wife and I are also the um, Bloomfield representatives to the, wild, the study committee for the Lower Farmington River and, and Salmon Brook Wild and Scenic Study. Um, I don't want to repeat uh, a lot of the things that are said tonight. Clearly, one of our main concerns is the uh, health of the river and any, you know, we've already heard that it's under stress and that is definitely true. Um, that is obviously a main concern of people tonight. The thing I would like to take a couple of minutes, especially from the comments that have been given, is sort of address maybe the 500 pound grill in the room. And that's the paradigm that we can have sustainability, which I've heard people refer to, and also have growth, and potentially not any growth. Um, I saw earlier the presentation that we had the proposed actions, and I've read the executive summary of the EIE, uh, e, haven't read the whole thing. Um, but I noticed missing from there was uh, one obvious, uh, to me obvious, uh, uh, option, which was uh, reduce the university size uh, and operations, to a sustainable level. Um, I also We also heard the folks from Mansfield say they wanted a sustainable community, but they also seem to be indicating that they wanted growth. Uh, I'm not sure how those two things are compatible. And I think what needs to be addressed here is we need to address what we really mean by sustainable. Uh, First Selectman Barlow made the comment that some of the items that are included in the growth plan are obviously, or to me obviously as to him, uh, things that I don't think we need to be looking at from a growth point of view. Uh, but even with those taken out, I still think you've got to ask the question, what ultimately is the size of the university? What ultimately is the size of Mansfield, Mansfield Depot, whatever? And we, we need to address that. And no one seems to be doing that in these discussions. Um, the focus seems to be trying to move from margin of safety to, uh, or move from growth to margin of safety. And again, when I saw the margin of safety numbers and I see them falling below one or the desired 1.15 for some extra margin, my question is, all right, how much would you have to shrink operations? How much, what size would you have to get to so that you can live within your own resources? And I realize contraction is not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy for us as a country. It's not going to be easy for us as a people. And we're hardwired to not shrink. But we're going to have to shrink. Contraction is going to be hard. It's going to be hard for us. And it's going to be hard for the NBC. Thank you. going around with uh, asking you to put your name and email address on that so we can, uh, as a group, we know who we are if we have to work on that. Thank you. Who is Philip Dunn, do you think? Who is me? Whoever wants to suck. 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Coy, Mr. Murphy, thank you for uh, hosting this uh, forum. Uh, I'm uh, Phil Dunn. I'm a resident of Farmington. I'm currently serving as the chairman of the Town Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, I appreciate the comments of uh, the folks who've already spoken, and I'm going to omit a good deal of what I was prepared to say. But what I would like to observe is that my commission, over a year ago, was asked to designate the portion of the Farmington River that passes through our town as a wild and scenic river. We did vote in favor of that. I read a good deal of uh, information about the Wild and Scenic River Act before we uh, cast our vote, and I was impressed with its purpose, and I feel that the MDC plan would frustrate that purpose. Uh, the act uh, discusses uh, maintaining the free-flowing condition of a wild and scenic river. The folks that uh, wrote uh, the act and commented on it indicated that although there may be dams on some of these river, <coughs> rivers, uh, there should be no other in-stream activities that would impair the flow of the river. And diverting over two million gallons of water a day from the Farmington River is indeed an activity that would impair the flow of the river. I would also observe that although Yukon's uh, desire to protect the Fenton and Willimantic rivers is laudable, and I urge them to do everything they can to preserve those rivers, uh, I'm concerned with the Farmington River. Uh, and the National Wild and Scenic River System, which was created in 1968, uh, is not well represented in Connecticut. We only have 5,828 miles of river in Connecticut, and only 39.3 miles of those rivers are designated as wild and scenic. That's less than 1% of the state's rivers. And I would hope that the MDC would take that into consideration since the largest stretch is indeed the uh, west branch of the Farmington River. And we're hoping to add additional uh, sections of the Farmington River to that uh, designation. Thank you. Hi, I'm Susie Norman. I live in Avon. Um, I want to share with you a letter that I plan to send to the MDC. It takes a slightly different angle from what we've all been talking about, but perhaps you'll see my message in it. Uh, let's talk money. According to the MDC strategic plan, objective number one is to, quote, expand the customer base to optimize the use of water or assets and grow revenue. This seems like a valuable goal for shareholders. However, more water to more spigots is not necessarily a guarantee of long-term profits. Let's look at a case example. White Bear Lake, Minnesota, a 2,400-acre lake that's 83 feet deep. For those of you who are not familiar with one of the prized lakes in the land of 10,000 lakes, White Bear Lake has been enjoyed by private landowners who own modest to large homes around the lake, as well as the fun-loving public who swim, sail, and fish on the lake. About two months ago, the White Bear Lake area residents sued the Department of Natural Resources because the water level in their lake has fallen about six feet in the last few years. The reason? Too many additional draws in the local aquifer caused water to sink out of White Bear Lake and into that aquifer. No one did the research to learn that the aquifer was supporting White Bear Lake. So when the new spigots were turned on, the level of White Bear Lake went down a lot. In fact, some homeowners have had to build additional docks that are several hundred feet long to stretch across yards of mud and muck that used to be lakefront property. Obviously, the value of those homes sank, too. The White Bear Lake residents are not suing for financial gain. They want their lake restored. Since the lake level started dropping there, they have seen a 70% drop in boat traffic, a mucky bottom that makes swimming unpleasant, and the closure of a county beach because of a dangerous drop-off. 
a U.S. geological study determined that White Bear Lake would need four inches of rainfall above the normal amount just to maintain its lake depth. Obviously, they can't depend on that. One proposed solution is to build a pipeline from another lake and pump water from that lake into their lake. <laughs> now, I don't pretend to know how the underground water channels in this area connect with each other, although someone pointed out that in New Hartford, McDonough Lake is supported by one of these... Uh, the Barkhamstead Reservoir. Water seeks its own level. Any additional water taken from one area means that another area may have less water. The homeowners and patrons of White Bear Lake are paying dearly for the growth of water demand at the other end of the pipeline up there. From what I've read, they will not go quietly into the swamp. <laughs> if the MDC option is approved and water begins to be drawn from this area and pumped to stores in Manfield, Mansfield, someone on this end of the line may suffer. My question is, if and when those who suffer sue the MDC, who will pay to fix the problem? How will that cost affect MDC strategic plan objective number one to expand revenue? Good evening and thank you. Um, Jeffrey Scarcella, I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Terrafield Water Company. Uh, we have a well field that is adjacent to the Farmington River in the town of Simsbury and Terrafield, and it supplies all the drinking water and fire protection water for our town. Now, I was interested to see some of the comments uh, posted earlier that talked about in the Fenton and Willimantic Rivers how there's interaction between drawing water out of the well fields and the level of the river. And I wonder if that couldn't work in reverse, that removing water from the river could draw water out of our well fields and compromise our supply of fresh water. So I think that, at a minimum, uh, further evaluation is deserved to see the impact on uh, all the sources of water supply in the area and how the reduction of water in that basin could affect our access to clean drinking water, whether it's through the MDC or not. Um, and I think that I won't reiterate the comments about that there's a new normal in terms of variation and seasonal fluctuations in water levels, but I think that any evaluation has to consider that variation and what the predicted trends and predicted demands are into the next at least 30, 40, 50 years, the best that we can. Um, in closing, I wanted to offer a suggestion as well, um, talking about um, technological development uh, for the technology park or, or other options. I think that anyone who's been a resident of Connecticut for any time knows that there are many cities, once proud, that have plenty of space to facilitate <laughs> economic development and would love to see investment in their uh, former industrial areas that are falling decrepit and uh, could, could really use that, that push to help reinvigorate the cities that we love. Ladies and gentlemen, um, my name is Ian Sorrell. I'm a Farmington Valley resident for almost 20 years. As you can tell by my accent, I don't originate from this area. Um, and like Susan Messino, um, I have a feeling of deja vu. And I really bring a grave warning from my native Great Britain and my hometown of Chesham, which is in the southeast of England. Um, Chesham takes its name from the river that once flowed through it. <laughs> and as a child I vividly remember being able to catch my first trout in the centre of that town. Not only that, but you were able to go to local water meadows and collect wild watercress. Um, it was an extraordinary environment to grow up in. However, over a period of nearly 30 to 40 years, um, through continual water abstraction, that river is no more. 
it, it flows from time to time. And like so many other streams and rivers in the area, it's fallen prey to the demands for increased water for local homes, local industry, and actually beyond its actual normal water area. It's being transferred by pipeline to other towns and, and areas. It's been sold. What might surprise you is that this once proud river actually commanded a mention in Isaac Walton's Complete Angler in about the mid-1500s. It was described as one of the finest trout rivers in all the land. It's now been reduced to a mere trickle. It's basically suffered not death by a thousand cuts, but by a thousand faucets, 10,000 faucets. Every decade, we were promised it would be the last increase in water abstraction. It never stopped. The chest is now classified as over-abstracted, which means that it has not enough water to meet only, sorry, it has only enough water to meet its environmental needs a mere 35% of the time. This decreased flow not only results in the river drying up in the middle of the summer, and actually many other periods, but leads to increased pollution, loss of habitat, and it is estimated that it can take at least a decade for a river to recover from a drought like that. This is an annual event. We owe it not only to ourselves, but more importantly to future generations, to live within our means, and that includes the demands we put upon our natural resources. I would urge everyone involved in this process to think again going ahead, before going ahead with any plans to divert more water away from the Farmington River. Thank you very much. My name is Kevin Zack. I come from the Naugatuck River. And if those that are unfamiliar with the Naugatuck River, it's the largest in-state river that travels from Torrington down to Derby. I'm here representing the Naugatuck River Revival Group, and we are in opposition to this diversion. Um, we are disturbed by the silencing of the Farmington River Watershed Association. Everybody that has visited the USGS water tables knows that there's not an average, even though you could use an average. In the state of Connecticut, it's going up and down so extreme that you cannot use the average. We walk many rivers, and one of our pastimes, as well as cleaning the river, is we can get in the middle of the river and walk a mile or miles in either direction, right through the middle of the river. As fun as that is, it can be very disturbing. So, uh, we caution you. Let's not, uh, let's learn from the lessons of the Chippewa River diversions into Waterbury and the Naugatuck River, as well as the mouth of the Colorado, I, I should say the, the end of the Colorado River, and Hetch Hetchy. So, um, forewarned is forearmed. Thank you. Chris 
Summer, followed by Judy Schaefer, followed by Mark Massaro. So could Mr. Chris Summer? My name is Chris Clemmer. I'm a uh, taxpayer and I live in Granby. Uh, I'd like to just expand uh, two points that have been made already and turn them into questions. One of them is that uh, previous speakers have talked about the silencing of the Fern Valley uh, River Watershed Association. My question for, for you, Con, is as an institution of higher learning, one whose uh, commitment is to expanding our knowledge, is the university willing to encourage uh, or maybe even obligate MDC to uh, release the Watershed Association from any um, restraints it may have and actively ask for their uh, honest and candid opinion of the MDC uh, diversion. The second uh, question uh, deals with some of the data that was presented about the so-called safety factors, which at certain times uh, go below one. In other words, the demand for water exceeds the capacity. And from my point of view, many, many miles from stores, I'm not familiar with the local area, um, the university and the, the water company appear to me to be two sides of the same coin. So my question is, it's a governance issue. It has to deal with boards of directors or whatever. How did uh, UConn build and commit to build and encourage expansion beyond its ability to support the water necessary for the expansion? <laughs> Miller, after Greg, I have Sarah Bogus and Alicia, Alicia Kennedy. Uh, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, come and comment this evening. I, uh, I'm one of the few people here who represent no one, serve on no committee. Um, <laughs> I'm just a uh, longtime user of the Farmington River and a, uh, an interested citizen. Uh, and and I, I think I, I, I've learned tonight one of the things that concerns me the most about the whole, the whole project. And uh, I don't want to, I tried to take some notes as you were speaking, David, with your opening comments. <clears throat> and I'm struck, uh, and I, I'm paraphrasing, but I think I have it right, that, that you opened the meeting and you, you asked the question, you know, why doesn't UConn have enough water? And then you pointed to data on the screen that would indicate UConn has enough water. And, and so, and then you asked the question, well, gee, if we, you know, based on this data, how come UConn doesn't have enough water? And I think the only conclusion I can draw from that is that Maybe all of this science and all of the data <clears throat> and all the analysis that goes into hydrology is not quite as precise as we're trying to be led it is when we're looking at the other proposals. So, so if that data, if the very data that would indicate Yukon has enough water is wrong, is faulty, how can we trust any of the other data that we've seen indicating that all these other projects are going to be safe? Um, The, um, the EIE has four alternatives, but has been, has been noted a couple of times tonight, not one of the alternatives um, required for UConn to change their plans in any way. And um, I, I think that that is at least one alternative that should be on the table. Um, you know, 
it's not without precedent. I think UConn has a lot of uh, big parts of that organization located throughout the state. And you know, it seems to me there's no reason we couldn't find a more suitable location for the technology park, park than, uh, than on campus in, in UConn. I have a couple of comments about the process that's, that's, uh, that's being followed. And uh, the previous speaker spoke about the, uh, the FRWA being being held to an agreement that they entered into with the NBC. Okay? Um, but at the NBC meeting, I asked uh, if, if that agreement could be amended and they could be granted permission to speak in a limited, or just on this one issue, not, not limiting their speech, but on this issue, and of course the answer is they, they could, but the NBC was unwilling to do that, and I think that's I think that's bad process, and I think that's if what if what this process is about is gathering information and have, allowing all the constituents to participate, that's inconsistent with that. Mm -hmm. Likewise, um, the DEEP has two roles to play here. Um, one part of the DEEP uh, rules on the diversion request, but another part of DEEP, the scientists that are here to protect our wildlife. Um, have no role to play because it's a potential conflict with the part of DEEP that has to rule on the diversion request. And I think that's a mistake because I think what that means is a lot of experts, the scientists who are, who are responsible in this state for protecting the wildlife, have no opportunity to input. And I'd, I'd like to see them uh, be involved. Schaefer of Westonsbury. Yes. Good evening. I'm John Schaefer from uh, Weston. I live in the resident of Westonsbury, Connecticut, and uh, I've submitted uh, written comments, but I won't go over them again. And uh, I don't have a problem with uh, Yukon needing water and looking for a supply. And I think it's admirable that they have done their uh, conservation programs and, and implemented that. But I have two issues from what I've read in the executive summary. And one is that uh, the uh, EIE looks at the issue of the, and I'm, I'm talking about the NBC option. That's the only one I'm concerned about that I have a problem with. Um, the NBC's uh, proposal was to put a pipe in going out through Manchester, Bolton, and through that area. And as other earlier speakers have talked, that's going to um, create uh, pressure for development. The, EIE, as part of its process, um, has to summarize the problems, but then it also has to look at possible mitigations. Well, it talks about the only mitigation that they come up with for that issue is uh, possible overlay, um, overlay zones, which Mansfield is looking at, hasn't implemented, um, but they are looking at it. The other towns where this uh, uh, pressure for additional development is uh, going to be aren't looking at those issues, because right? I believe it even says one of them has already ruled that issue, that out. But even if Mansfield goes ahead and comes up with these overlay zones, that can be undone at some later date, as we all know towns compete with each other to try and attract development to help with their uh, tax base. So there will be pressure, even if Mansfield creates overlay zones along the pipe, there will be pressure at some future date to take away those overlay zones to attract commercial and um, office development along the pipeline. Uh, the second issue is that in looking through the EIE, I was, the EIE is, uh, the purpose of it is to look at the impact of the action and um, come up with solutions mitigation to it. The EIE has looked at impacts in the Mansfield area, but it never looked at the impacts in Farmington where the real environmental impacts will be. So if we go ahead and, and NBC builds the pipeline and 
all this development comes, and the, and the EIE even talks about uh, making connections to local water uh, systems that are there for emergency reasons, and we all know emergency will turn into, gee, we need this and we're going to connect up permanently. Um, if they do that, we're going to have this demand that's there permanently, and it will impact the Farmington River, and will impact us who live in the Farmington River uh, to the benefit of uh, Mansfield and, and the other side of the uh, state. Thank you. I would like to see included in this study an alternate, and that is for using what's called. Please state your name and address yes, the record. Yes, Stephen Sorrow. I live in Suffield, and I'm here to speak for a group of taxpayers who are looking at the possibility of using Connecticut River water for blue water, water acceptable for flushing toilets and nothing else. This is a very common practice now in the southern tier of the country, and uh, I think it's inevitable that it will happen here sooner or later. Now, here's an ideal situation. We're looking to get enough money to incorporate to provide blue water, gray water, whatever you want to call it, to the big prison in Suffield. It's certainly a controlled atmosphere, and when they get through looking at it and estimating the cost to replumb the prison, then all the toilets can be using strictly Connecticut River water, untouched, unfiltered. Now, we're looking at a million, about 400,000 gallons on our first go-round because the prison uses a million gallons of water a day. And our architects tell us that if you were to replace all the toilet flushing, you would save about 40% of your water usage. So we're not going to save that. We're going to replace it with Connecticut River water, which is reasonably clean. It's not good enough for uh, drinking, certainly. But it's a way, and I think that if we could get Yukon and all the other uh, wizards of SMART, to join in our program, we would have good, solid information for any other town that wanted to use some of the river water. Thank you. Yes, my name is David Sinish, and I live in the Collinsville section of Canton. I'm speaking as a private citizen tonight, but I've been a, board, a, a member of the Board of Directors of Farmington River Watershed since 1981. I was very much involved with the Wild and Scenic designation, which actually resulted in 1981 from the MDC having a referendum to build a pipe from the West Branch to the East Branch. And that referendum was voted on by MDC towns and not the donor towns. FRWA raised a whole lot of questions and we were really surprised when that referendum went down. But the reason it went down is there were so many unanswered questions. Now, 
it's very gratifying to see very many people here really looking after the Farmington River. But I want to bring up a one or maybe two things. The MDC's agreement with the FRWA of, you know, had, had, having the FRWA not speak about diversions was in, embodied in something that is uh, called the Portland Agreement. FRWA entered that agreement only because rather than having the Farmington River as you know, the west branch of the Farmington River as the next water source, the agreement said that the well fields in Glastonbury would be tapped first. Well, the fields in Glastonbury are fed by the Connecticut River, what we might think of as a rather unlimited water supply. What I have not heard addressed is what is the current status of those well fields. I have heard that perhaps there are some pollution sources. If there are pollution sources and fuels cannot be used, then you bet the west branch of the Farmington River is right in line. And that's what this is all about. Another thing that I had in mind was, well, let's think of 1963. How many years ago is that? It was obviously 50 years ago. This planning horizon is for 50 years. Think of what it was like in 1963. Would they ever project forward to where we are now? And is it reasonable to expect that with a rate of technological change in water supply, water treatment, that a 50-year horizon is what you want to look at? Good evening. My name is Marlene Snechensky. I'm a two-time Connecticut taxpayer in Simsbury in the town of New Hartford, uh, also a taxpayer in Massachusetts. Um, I'm a resident of the Farmington Valley for most of my life, a naturalist and philanthropist. I sit on several boards and committees in the state of Connecticut and Massachusetts, and I'm here to say that the water wars in Connecticut have begun. I've been a longtime member of the Farmington River Watershed Association, and I've come to experience um, what conservation and preservation mean in regards to the two-thirds of our planet is water-based. I understand the importance of water, and I've also come to the understanding that the average human being still thinks that when water comes out of a faucet, that it's magic, <laughs> that it comes from somewhere and where it comes from is precious. That is why, first of all, I want to voice my disgust of the MBC trying to silence the Farmington River Watershed Association for what they are sired to do, which is to be an advocate of the people and to educate and to support the towns. Not only the towns that are in the watershed, but for knowledge of all people in the state of Connecticut. I also ask and demand a withdrawal of proposal number four, as of what it means is for the MDC, because it is truly a violation of state policy, and it is unethical because it is asking for a private business deal to fund the state of Connecticut's needs. It is senseless. There is no econo economical sense to it, and it is also uh, opening up unknown environmental consequences. Thank you.
Coleman. I have Matt Supernaut. Good evening. I'm Wanda Coleman. I'm president of the Tarifville Village Association. I live on in Tarifville, where mankind's relationship with the Farmington River goes back at least 7,000 years where Olympic-class kayakers play in the Tarifu Gorge, and where the Farmington River and the Salmon Brook join to form outstanding examples of all the resource values of this river. Thank you, Yuhan, for this public hearing and for extending the time for public comment. Thank you, MDC, for making this proposal, and especially for putting the muzzle on the Farmington River Watershed Association. Look what has come about. Fortunately, the FRWA has done its job, and through research, teaching, stewardship, and the Wild and Scenic Designation Study Committee has taught us well. Not allowing this group to speak out at this time has contributed to raising the collective consciousness of the community. Knowledge on this topic and responsibility for action by all groups and citizens, now and in the future. It has enabled significant outpouring concern and opposition to the MDC's, MDC's proposal to divert water out of the Farmington River Basin. The Caracal Village Association is one of these groups. What comes to this watershed should stay in this watershed. <coughs> as the president of the Caracal Village Association and as a citizen residing in the village of Caracal, town of Simsbury, Farmington River Watershed, Connecticut, the water planet Earth, I oppose this MDC proposal for every reason that has been presented. Mansfield and Yukon, please do not accept the MDC proposal. Thank you. Excuse me, I'm Pat Supernaut and I live in Mansfield. Um, Mansfield is um, nestled next to the last green valley and within earshot of the quiet corner. Our rural character defines us. Let's make no mistake about this. This is <coughs> urbanization. I ask that you not be myopic in your approach to opposing this on all sides and in all aspects. We need your help. We are all interconnected in the state. The residents of Mansfield have had a long and proud tradition of environmental protectionism. And we've also had a very long and uneasy alliance or relationship with the university since its inception in the 1800s. We know very well about our relationship to, some say, the 600-pound gorilla in the room. I call it the Vatican. We've had... <laughs> We've had opportunities in the past, and we have met those challenges, such as the Pfizer program that we were able to successfully stop. We gave East Hartford the football stadium after it was clear we didn't want that. Let's make one thing clear. It is true that Mansfield has some need for water, but the need is over-exaggerated. They need approximately 30,000 gallons of water for the congregate care facility, which is a private developer. 170,000 gallons or more for the six parcels that are located at Four Corners, and about 235,000 gallons of water for secondary growth, which is a result of the tech park and a result of bringing in this water. <coughs> that 235,000 represents 60% of the total amount that Mansfield is asking for. That's 435,000 gallons in total. The 1.9 million is coming to Mansfield. I question whether Mansfield is really asking for that. The residents have had absolutely no opportunity, up or down, yes or no, to say whether or not we want this. The second point I would like to make clear, and I made it clear last week, the Innovation Partnership building, the 125,000 square foot building that the university proposes for their north campus, does not need this water to be built. They've come out publicly and said so two weeks ago. Therefore, what is the rush? Everyone is speaking as though the tech part is a fait accompli. There is no funding beyond that building for the tech park. So I ask you to join with us and look at this in a statewide perspective rather than individually. 
for 30 seconds. One question I would like the EIE to consider before that is over is, have you considered, and I know this was mentioned in the Four Corner Water and Sewer meeting to Jason Coit, have you considered looking at raising the Eagleville Dam one or two feet only? There's enough water that flows over that dam all times of the year that if you had that dam raised up one or two feet, you might have enough water in those well fields along the Willimantic. And I'd like to have that issue looked at if possible. Um, and one last thing, one last thing I would like to leave you with. Please be mindful that they have hired or are in the process of hiring a law firm for a three-year period at $500,000 to fight the people, the will of the people on this. And I ask that you support the residents of Mansfield and our position on this relative to uh, urbanization and growth. Thank you. Who are they? Who are they? Who are they? I'm sorry, the question was asked. The University of Connecticut has an RFP. It was in the uh, Hartford Current. There was a notice that they are considering hiring an, a law firm to consider all aspects of bringing this uh, water to, uh, to the university and to Mansfield. Thank you. Margaret Miner with Rivers Alliance of Connecticut, and um, we'll be submitting written comments. It is a, a pleasure to hear uh, such uh, thoughtful and informative comments. I look forward to hearing the remainder. Um, as a statewide policy organization, we have uh, uh, several as aspects of this issue we'll be looking at, so you can uh, continue to educate me. <laughs> One is um, a red flag goes up for us any time any utility is exporting water out of its service area when it has dry streams in its service area. So we always advocate for um, some improvement for those streams, at least in concert with any export plans. Up-to-date data is becoming essential in almost all the issues we uh, look at, whether it's stream flow or, or water supply, we need the latest uh, science data. We're concerned with the EIE process, as I think C uh, Council on Environmental Quality is. W w the process and the results just don't seem suited to this type of proposal. And whether that's, uh, that's something that we should be looking at. Do we need a different kind of process? Can the same process be improved? And finally, uh, of course, the state planning uh, very poor planning always at UConn, um, poor planning across the state so that we're dealing with these things. We have no state water budget, really no state uh, water distribution plan, and so uh, we need to get onto that, and I think this might actually spur us uh, to make some progress, and thank you again so much, all of you. Mm -hmm. My name is Jeffrey McCutcheon. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Connecticut. I joined Connecticut in 2008 after receiving my PhD from Yale, uh, where I lived in New Haven from 2002 to 2008, and am now coming as a resident of Tolland. Uh, I'm not here to represent the university, so please do not uh, quote me as saying so. Um, but I am also an uh, expert on advanced water treatment technologies. And I believe that there may be alternatives that have not been considered uh, to water transfer that are available for Mansfield and Yukon specifically to have its cake and eat it too. You should all be applauded for being here tonight. I don't, I don't believe that you could differentiate this from a similar meeting in the Colorado River Basin or Southern California or the Owens Valley any of the other areas where water transfers have had major impacts on economic development as well as environmental impacts. And I'm not too knowledgeable about these impacts of the water transfers that are proposed. But I do know that for, in a 50-year time frame, we will have to completely 
rethink where we get our water from and how we treat our water. Because as populations grow, as demographics change, as industry grows and falls and grows again, we must consider alternative sources of water that are local rather than considering long transfers. And so I may suggest a method that has been controversial in the past, but may be our only hope for sustainable water development in the future, and that is water reuse. Jason has already talked about and has been implemented, it has been critical in implementing water reuse strategies on UConn's campus, the $400,000 reclamation facility, which provides water to the largest water user on UConn's campus, which is the UConn power plant, which makes about 25% of the total UConn water usage. And that is an effort that is to be applauded. It has done a dramatic, it will dramatically change how UConn uses this water and the total water use of the campus. But maybe we could take that a step further. What if I could tell you that we could take every drop of water that UConn uses, reuse it, and put it right back into the system? A closed loop process where drinking quality water can be reclaimed from our wastewater. This is a challenge to sell to the public because toilet to tap strategies have been <laughs> somewhat uh, uh, difficult to um, <laughs> convince people to accept. But that is exactly what we may have to do in the future. And we are not, we would not be the first people to do this. There's a lot of water reuse in Southern California. There's water reuse in Sub-Saharan Africa, where direct potable reuse is done. So perhaps we can consider if we are to look at Tech Park causing water shortages on campus, maybe technology is our answer. And perhaps we should consider that in the future. So thank you very much. My name is Pat Bresnahan. I'm a citizen of the town of Wyndham. I lived in Mansfield for over 20 years. I recently retired as the Associate Director of the Connecticut Institute of Water Resources at UConn. I'm currently a member of the Wilmantic River Alliance, but tonight I'm not speaking um, on behalf of any of those organizations. But as a member of the Connecticut Institute of Water Resources, I had the wonderful opportunity to be a part of discussions throughout the state related to how we should allocate the water resources that we've been given. And also been fortunate to be a part of the technical uh, discussions leading to the streamflow regulations. But if you combine that with the fact that with, three years ago, I moved to downtown Willimantic and now live in a repurposed old um, factory space called Art Space. And every day I walk down empty, dilapidated buildings on Main Street and I see so many people out of work and, uh, and, and people, other people in the community trying so hard to bring and revitalize the life in downtown Willimantic. I have to say that when I see this um, process going on, I say, well, this is not the right tool for this kind of decision. What we need is a planning process that has at least three qualities. It has to be fair, it has to be prudent, and it has to be well integrated. By fair, I mean we need to have representation from all of the different types of stakeholders that are affected by water planning decisions. Not only should they be given an opportunity to speak at forums like this, but the people who make those decisions need to represent the will of those people. By prudent, I mean we have to have decisions that are based on sound science, on good understanding of how much water is available where and when, how much demand there currently is, what the water is being used for, and also uh, what, what makes sense economically. How do we balance the need for economic growth in one part of a region with a desire to maintain a rural quality in another? And so, I, and by integration, then, I mean bringing together both the planning for economic development with the planning for a water resources management. So I hope that I was really heartened to hear a proposed legislation to uh, 
encourage statewide water planning, and I would hope that we have a regionally based planning process then that is fair, that is prudent, and that is well integrated. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ray Peck. Um, I didn't get here in time to sign up with the official delegations from the towns. I am actually a member of the Board of Slepin in Bar Kingston, which is on the west branch of the Farmington River, as well as the east branch of the Farmington River, which is one of the reasons I want to speak. Um, but I, I have a couple points I want to make. One is that the uh, I've been involved in the river most of my life. My dad, who's no longer with us, was one of the original members, original members of the Farming Valley Watershed Association. He was one of the original members of the group to get the Upper River declared a wild and scenic waterway. So I've been involved with the river a long time. Um, in terms of the fishing, uh, somebody referenced that it's one of the pristine spots in the state. I have to tell you, it's one of the pristine spots in the entire world. And I know that because in travels that I've been fortunate to be able to take with my wife. We've met fishermen from such diverse places as Kiev, Ukraine, and um, Tokyo, Japan, who are avid trout fishermen. And when they found out we lived on the Farmington River in Bar Camps, they were flabbergasted. They'd heard of those places. In, in that other parts of the world, thousand miles, thousands, 10,000 miles each way, they know about the Farmington River from Riverton to Pleasant Valley as a pristine place to fish. And lastly, I want to speak for a minute. Uh, one of the speakers a while ago from Mansfield talked about don't take a myopic view in opposition to the NBC proposal. I don't think we're taking a myopic view. The town of Bar Campstead is over 60% owned, basically, by the NBC. That's where the reservoir is that feeds Hartford, West Hartford, Newington, Windsor, East Hartford, Bloomfield. I don't think we're being myopic at all. We've given enough, and we'd like to preserve what we have left. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Daria Hart, and I live in New Hartford, and I'm here um, to speak um, first for the New Hartford Democratic Town Committee. We're another group who are opposing the NDC and the plan for this. Um, we think it will adversely affect our town, our river, and our way of life. And we add our voice to say, please do not accept this plan. But I'm also here as somebody who has lived on the west branch of the Farmington River for 29 years in the center of New Hartford. I don't know where the NDC is getting their figures. I'm not a scientist. But I watch that river every summer. I listen to the canoes and the kayaks scraping against the rocks. It's really low. And it's low all summer long. They say July. There's been a lot of Junes that it's really low. And if they've got all this extra water, why aren't they putting it in the Farmington? Because you know what? It could use it. So I hope that with my one last statement would be to the towns of um, to the town and to the university. You've heard a lot of organizations here upset and a lot of individuals because the Farmington Watershed Association cannot speak on this issue. I ask you and urge you that if you're going to continue to move forward with the MDC, you make it a stipulation that they release the Watershed Association so that that organization that we trust to give us information can speak and speak, not only give us the information, but speak for us. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Harmon Poole. I'm from Simsbury. see a lot of familiar faces. I'm here not to represent me, but to represent my wife, a very wise person who, when she found out 
why I was not home this evening. I told her the background, a bit of the background. As she very wisely said, it seems to me that there's a much larger river closer to stores, <laughs> and certainly they could draw a fair amount of that to take care of uh, lawn watering, toilet flushing, etc. at the university, and I couldn't rebut that. <laughs> I just wanted to make, just clarify the myopic comment. I was not suggesting that I was supporting the NBC. I was suggesting that I would hope you would look at all of these options and consider um, them equally. We're not in, I'm not personally in favor of them, uh, except for those that are within our own borders and which are uh, sustainable and are environmentally sound. That's all I wanted to do is part that. Would we look at that? Okay, thank you. further comments at this time, when I'm adjourning the hearing. Again, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you for commenting. Thank you for listening. Um, a few other things, again, we'll be posting the comments that I received written uh, on our website. Uh, when this transcript is available, it will also be on our website as well as a transcript from the previous meeting. Look for that as early as tomorrow, uh, if not a day or two later. Uh, again, thank you for coming. And, uh, whoever ends up with the, uh, the book with the uh, email, take it back. <laughs> thank you for listening. Um, a few other things. Again, we'll be posting the comments that I received written uh, on our website. Uh, when this transcript is available, it will also be on our website as well as a transcript from the previous meeting. Look for that as early as tomorrow, uh, if not a day or two later. Uh, again, thank you for coming. And, uh, whoever ends up with the, uh, the book with the uh, email, take it back. <laughs>